Where are all my empaths out there? HSPs, highly sensitive people, have you heard of these terms? You're gonna definitely want to join today as Reagan and Renee, both clinicians here at Sage Holistic Health and Wellness Center, have a chat about the gift of empathy. My name is Emily Sellis and I am the host for the Sage Holistic Show. Sage is a 501c3 nonprofit organization building community by providing education and counseling about physical, mental, and spiritual well being. We encourage all of our listeners to find their own path to what holistic wellness means to you. Hi, everyone. Happy Sunday. Hi, Reagan. Hello. So, Reagan and I. Um, well, I guess I'll start. My name is Renee and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist and Reiki practitioner at SAGE. And um, Regan, you want to? I am Regan Hovey. I am an associate marriage and family therapist and an associate um, professional clinical counselor at SAGE as well. So Regan and I were talking about how we both really enjoy working with clients who um, either identify, identify either as um, an empath or a highly sensitive person and just felt like it'd make for a really fun Saturday or Saturday, geez, good Sunday chat. And just to talk about what that means. And um, yeah, so, and of course, in the comment section, please, if you have any comments or anything that you'd like for us to answer, we're here. Yeah. But yeah, so um, maybe we should start by um, asking, or I'll start by asking you, what is an empath for those who might not know? Ah, oh, man. Uh, I I feel like empathy has become this like topic, right? That it's like all encompassing, right? Where people even start to ask like, um, you know, if I, if I cry at a movie, does that mean, and I, am I an empath? Um, if I experience emotions, right. And there's, I think it, it kind of like even depends on, um, like the definition that you're looking at, right. Because there's, there's different versions of what like empathy can, can be comprised of. So in some ways it's sort of like, um, you know, emotional empathy is sort of like marked by this like vicarious, uh, expression of like feeling others emotions right where where people sort of like start to describe it as almost like they like can sense what other people are feeling just like by kind of like being in their presence um, there's also just cognitive empathy which is sort of a more grounded in um, thinking about the experiences of other people but then of course there is um, empathic concern which is more grounded in kind of wanting people to feel better, which still requires some level of that sort of attunement to like what's coming up for them in the moment. But then rather than fixating on feeling what it is that other person is feeling, it's kind of um, working to um, just more from a place of concern, I suppose. Um, but I mean, gosh, I, there's all sorts of ways that it can present, but I want to hear a little bit from you because I know we started talking about this a little bit before we went live and we both were just like naming up because there's, we're really, we like this population. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think for, for me, um, when we were talking about um, kind of what, what does this, um, I guess, particular client look like, or what, what does that mean to have a client and um, who identifies as an empath or highly sensitive person. And, you know, we we're both saying that it, when we have a client and we can recognize these traits, they might not even recognize that they are that, I guess that label, I don't want to say label, but they might not recognize that that is why they're feeling the way that they're feeling. And so for me, I feel like it's really fun to be able to you know, hear my clients' stories and, and just kind of put things together and, and say, I, I always go into it and say, do you feel like you're really sensitive when it comes to picking up on other people's energy? Or, you know, when people, when people walk in the room, do you feel like you can just, like, you, you, your energy changes um, simply by, you know, a person walking in the room or crowds or things that can't really be explained otherwise? And 
Um, I think just kind of being in tune to that and understanding what that is is really powerful because um, I know there are a lot of, we were talking a lot of kind of not so nice associations that come with being a highly sensitive person. I know for me, I can't tell you how many times I've been told, oh, you're so sensitive or you have no backbone, um, you know, all these things that don't sound so nice. And so um, when I connect with with my clients in that way, I feel like it's just that normalizing is such a, it's such a cool moment to be like, oh my gosh. So it's not that I'm weak or whatever other people are making, however they're making me feel it's normal and there's a name for it. So to me, I feel like that's why I'm super passionate about working with this population. Um, but yeah, so that's, I think that's why I felt like it would be really fun to, to just to share from our perspective and yeah. being a highly sensitive person myself and, um, you know, being able to connect. That being said, Renee, I'm wondering for you if, if, if that, um, kind of lent itself to a desire to working with people who then, um, maybe, um, are impasse as well, even if they maybe don't know that they are. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I feel like, I feel like it's that, like I said, just, you know, for me, I know the clients that I'm um, referring to the empath or highly sensitive person, they usually come in talking about um, symptoms of anxiety or depression, panic. But what I hear, um, what I hear a lot is feeling lonely or feeling isolated because maybe they feel different from their friends, different from their family. And, you know, that, that's a really not a fun place to be in when you feel lonely in your, in your world. So, um, so for me, I think that's why, that's where my, um, just giving my clients the verbiage or the, the understanding that, um, of what it is. That's why, that's why it was really important for me to, to be able to connect and kind of normalize those experiences with my clients. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. I mean, I feel like that really got me there. Like that um, piece that you're talking about, like people coming in kind of talking about how, that loneliness piece um, of sort of like feeling so alone in their own distress. And especially if you sort of um, identify as that HSP, it, it's that distress can be really quite an exaggerated and elevated level of distress that you feel alone in um like I mean, at times i mean i i certainly know that like some clients that i've worked with feel like you know um almost like i guess i've i've heard people sort of come in describing their sensitivities almost like a curse like uh, i wish i didn't feel so deeply and so so strongly about things you know and then like having the people in their life sort of echoing these sentiments of like, wow, you're just, you're really dramatic. Yeah, um, I know. It, we're, I keep, feel like we're made to feel like it's a bad thing or like it's a, like you said, a curse or um, something negative. But um, I think that's what, that's what I like about getting to work with um, almost opening my client's eyes up to this idea of what it feels like to be such a feeling person and that it's okay. Um, but there's so many advantages of being an empath. And I think focusing on those, that's what's really important to me. Normalizing the stuff that's not so fun, but just really, um, you know, honing in on those really positive traits that come with it. Do you yeah. feel like, do you feel like you um, relate to some of those stereotypes or some of those like, oh, you're so sensitive or you're, you know, those, I think they become like a schema, you know, these scripts that stay, stay with us forever. And, you know, and we're made to feel like they're not positive things. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I, I certainly do. I know for myself, it's even um, like considering like childhood, like thinking about like the ways in which like to be a sensitive child in the world can be, um, difficult for everyone involved in that child's development yeah. um, I know for myself I mean it was even like a, this like sensitivity to really like any 
kind of stimulus, whether that be, I mean, I had the thing particularly with my socks, if they were not in this perfect alignment, then it, I really just would lose it and, and not, um, and everyone around me was sort of just, you know, what do we do? Yeah. <laughs> And so from a very young age, I definitely had to kind of like fit into that label of like, you're really sensitive. And to me, what I took that to mean was I'm a burden. Yeah. Uh, oh, that's, yeah. That's such a powerful, um, yeah, such a powerful example of how we get these ideas in our head based on what other people don't understand. And, you know, when we're kids, we can't put a name to it. We can't, hey, I'm just, I'm just a highly sensitive person. I'm okay but we don't, yeah. you know, we, we feed off of our family or feed off of others and how, how they handle that. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like a lot of even like, um, people that I've worked with, um, ultimately like what they've learned through their development is like, it's, it's largely been in an attempt to sort of push down or push away those feelings so sometimes that ends up being um sort of like manifesting in some sort of like um substance abuse or like in eating disorder right where it's like sort of like these things that we can like manage and control and use as an outlet Mm -hmm. um or something that kind of like numbs those just intense feelings because it feels like there's no um alternative like kind of reprieve from feeling so deeply um I know certainly for myself it became even very um kind of grounded in in people pleasing right and and, and really trying to like focus my attention on how can I be of assistance then to others how can I try to use this tool to my advantage um however of course in some instances when taken to an extreme, um, it definitely did not lend itself to a sort of balanced um, life. (laughs) Yeah, well, yeah, that's a good point. Um, Just, I was just thinking about all the different ways that, um, you know, most people probably don't think about how just being a sensitive person can really affect all areas of life. I mean, I'm sure people who don't connect with feeling sensitive or or like oh, what's the big deal you're just you know you just have a lot of emotions well it's so much more than that and um just when you're talking I was thinking about how it affects relationships and how um you know being an empath or being um, a highly sensitive person we tend to um I feel like it's like we just have this need to please and want to make everybody happy and fix things and um but it can also you know very loyal and caring and um, really good friends, you know, having a, an empath as a friend, it's, you know, those are good friends to have because they're always going to be there and have your best interests in mind. And, um, but the problem for the empath or the highly sensitive person is sometimes you can give too much and, um, and then put it, it, um, it, like the substance abuse, um, eating disorder, it can become this um, codependent relationship. Like I need I need to make you feel good because it makes me feel good. Um, And then, Mm -hmm. and then that oversharing or overgiving in relationships can become codependent. It it can also turn up into really toxic relationships because, you know, there's, there's almost like a, you know, a, a, like a sign on the forehead. I have so much love to give, you know, who needs a lot of love. And so sometimes people who are takers, um, you tend to find people who have these big hearts and big, big emotions to give. And um, the dynamic becomes toxic because it's not a give or take. It's becomes, you know, the empath tends to give, give, give. And then that person takes, takes, takes. And then you get burnt out. You get burnt out in relationships. And um, it's just, you know, so toxic, toxic relationships are, I feel like, more common than we realize because um, then there's also as an empath you feed off of your partner and if your partner is angry or depressed or anxious you know the empath will feed off of that and and not kind of be able to separate is this my are these my feelings or the their feelings and so you know that's I feel like an area people don't really necessarily understand how that works it's not just about being sensitive (laughs) so 
That is such an excellent point. And I feel like, um, like as you're like talking about like the toxic relationships and even like that, um, the difficulty in being able to discern like what are my emotions and what are maybe the people around me, my partner, my friend, my family. Um, and then I think then that in and of itself can contribute to that um, sort of prevalence of getting involved in toxic relationships because initially what might feel like um, helpful and good, right? In terms of, um, you know, that initially can definitely present as like validating for yourself of like, you know, I help other people to feel better. Mm -hmm. um, however, if left totally unchecked, it, it sort of becomes this like depletion of like your cup is empty. <laughs> and because the concern is always with other people because you don't know what's yours and what's theirs. Right. Right. Yeah. And so you try to kind of feed more. Well, if I don't feel good about this, then that must mean I need to give more because when you're picking up in other people's energy and, and they're not feeling that like um, gratitude or they're just taking it, it, you, I think as a sensitive person, you come back to yourself instead of saying, hey, they're ungrateful. We say, well, what did we do wrong? And I think that's something, you know, that I notice a lot too in relationships with my clients and um, in, you know, toxic relationships that they're in that they don't recognize that, um, you know, their role in this and how you don't always have to give, give, give. And to be able to recognize those signs when you're picking up on other people's energy and it's not your responsibility to please everybody or to, to fill everybody's cup before your own. And it, it gets, it's hard and, and, you know, to piggyback off of that, it can really take a toll on your health, not just affect oh relationships, God. but health, um, you know, in all kinds of ways, emotionally, physically. Um, yeah. Do you, what, what symptoms, or what do you think about when it comes to health and how like empaths can present health wise? I mean, in so many, I mean, it's, it's interesting because of what in some instances, what I'll see is actually like, um, emotional burnout, where it's, um, and, and sometimes it's, it's very selective emotional burnout. Like maybe they're able to be um, there and willing for everybody else, but not then like the compassion and the empathy that they have for themselves is very limited. Yeah. Um, and it's largely because there is only so much um, ability to then, but then also like, I mean, chronic fatigue. I was just thinking that that was, yeah, certainly chronic fatigue. And, and that's largely because in, in some ways, like I see, um, some HSPs or empaths very much in line with, um, um, like in some ways it can present as almost like a hypervigilance because you are so aware of everything that's going on around you, whether that be um, like stimulus of bright lights or loud noises or just like the, the crowds. Like, yeah, all of it. Yeah. Right. And it's um, and because of that, it, it just it can put you on this place of sort of being in that hypervigilant state, which again, as we all know, and I think the research again and again has showed us that that's not necessarily a sustainable state to, um, to stay in and to be in. Um, yeah. But. And I think when you are sensitive to energy or to other people's energy and you take it all in, you're essentially, you're just like wearing it. You're without even, without even, realizing you're just absorbing and wearing and and that can be really become really heavy and um in like you said the chronic fatigue exhaustion it's all so it's also normal I mean, we think about wearing all this stuff all day that doesn't even belong to you um one of the things that you know i was reading about how it takes longer for a person, you know, highly sensitive person to wind down at the end of the day. I don't know if you relate to that, um, but just, it, I know there are sometimes I would come home from a really long busy day at work and I'm just depleted. I, my brain cannot fit anything else. I just, I need alone time. And I know my family knows by now, you know, I, I have to recharge. I have to be by myself for, you know, give me 10, 15 minutes. I just have to recharge. And, um, you know, one, I, I always think about when I, I went to Venice beach with my family one week, one, like on a Saturday, 
all of that energy just coming. I mean, the crowds and just lots of different things I'm absorbing. I was completely knocked, knocked out on Sunday. I couldn't do anything. It just took all of my energy. And, you know, I feel like people, it probably sounds so silly, but I knew what it was. I just, I, I needed to drink water. I needed to relax and just took me a whole day to, um, to unwind from that amount of energy coming at me yeah. but so I don't do I don't do crowds as well as I used to but I've, le I've learned to protect myself I think that that experience opened my eyes up to the importance of protection and being able to um, just not own what isn't mine to, yes. to give it back yeah how do you do with crowds do you feel like that's an area I feel like um, it just, it kind of depends for me and it depends on, um, I mean, a number of things just in the sense of like um, the context, right? If it's, if it's a crowd because it's um, like a big gathering that I really like feel motivated to be at, then I, I feel better at like kind of like managing that versus if it's like, I'm at the beach or at the grocery store and then there's suddenly a lot of people there and it's like, oh no. <laughs> um, um. Yeah. Uh, that I was just thinking about a, um, shoot, there's a, like an idea that not, you said emotional, emotional burnout, um, but there's this other, it's kind of similar, but about um, like social burnout. Have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah. So, I feel like it's it's really hard to explain to friends or family when you know I can't be on the go all day every day. The weekends for me are not about like how much can I squeeze in in a short amount of time because I almost just like need one busy day and one day to relax because I get super overwhelmed socially if I have too many things going on. And I know that probably makes for um, I'm probably not the, the best, I guess, companion or, you know, friend when it comes to that, because I just can't, I can't be on the go and I can't show up to all the social things because it's just, I have to know my limits. And so um, well, that social burnout's real for me. In some ways, so I, I feel like um, I, I hear in that even like the expectations that we might like have like, placed on ourselves that we yes. should and I think it's even that's it's very reflective of the society that we live in which is very like hustle and always be on the go and always be grinding and always be yeah. doing something and I just think it's again in a lot of ways like in in practice not super realistic yeah um and I know like certainly for for myself and for clients that I've worked with this in and of itself has been like a big area that we have to sort of focus around is sort of like looking and un uncovering these resentments that sometimes people will have because they don't know where their energetic boundaries lie right it's sort of yeah. like when you've been pushed beyond your sort of like window of tolerance mm -hmm. uh, and then you're out and you're like, oh, I should have stayed in. I should have done this thing. Right. And then you're resentful, but then you're not saying anything. And then it just accumulates. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know a lot with my clients, boundary setting, it's really important to, to say, no, I'm sorry. I can't show up for you today. Or, um, you know, no, I just, I have too much on my plate. It's sometimes really hard to, um, for an impact to learn to say no, because, as we said before, we um, are so focused on not hurting people's feelings, making them feel good and, and wanting to just be, um, you know, I guess the loyal friend and saying no can be really hurtful. And so saying no is really, um, really hard, but really important. I know that's one thing, just being assertive and um, learning to say no. I know those are two things that with my clients, I know we focus on a lot. Yeah, certainly. And, and I feel like in, in, in so many ways, it's sort of, um, even for some of my clients, it's been sort of this reframe around, particularly when they do present as very like they're one of their like core values, you know, is like related to maybe like relationships or there's some sort of like social component. Um, yeah. and, and really like looking at like, you know, your ability to show up for the people in your life is so contingent on like 
your own like ability to show up for yourself, right? To to address your own needs because it's un, it's highly unlikely you'll be able to meet their needs without really right. <laughs> without making contact with like a significant again like resentment or just like overwhelm. So yeah, yeah, just, we have to show up for ourselves first. Yeah, yeah. 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 What are some things that you do to, um, obviously, you know, we can't get rid of this, this intense feeling or this absorption of other people's energy and um, you're either an empath or you're not. And so it doesn't go away. So when you're working with your clients or even, you know, your own personal journey, what are some things that you talk about as far as managing those symptoms to, to you know, avoid maybe the, the burnout or the emotional burnout, social burnout, what are some techniques or things that you try to talk about, you know, I guess like coping skills or. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and I think like, even like you noted earlier, huge, maybe, maybe one of like the first things that ends up being pretty helpful to address, especially is like the boundary setting. Yeah. Um, but then Emotion regulation is a pretty big one um, because in some ways it's sort of like we, we essentially working on providing tools for them to address what's coming up for them in a way that that's feels um, more manageable. Right. And so in some ways that is even around like the um, getting a better sense of their own boundaries, like, where am I? Where, how, how many things am I um, trying to do each day? What are the expectations? And in some ways it's even around like unpacking the expectations that they have of themselves um, surrounding mm-hmm. whatever that presenting problem may be. So maybe like their um, exhaustion or their um, the issues and problems are showing up most readily at work or maybe in their relationships. And then so sort of unpacking what expectations are you holding yourself to and maybe unknowingly and not really realizing how realistic they may be for you, right? Because in some ways, I I think so many empaths have been told consistently across time, like you need to be this way, you need to be this way, you need to be this way. And so what we've done too is we've we've absorbed the expectations of of people that don't have the same kind of um, life experience. (laughs) And and so what may be a realistic expectation for somebody else doesn't always align with what might be a realistic expectation for us. So a lot of like work around just like um, increasing Mm -hmm. self-awareness. Yeah, self-forgiveness, self-worth. I think self-worth too, because you're saying all these people are coming at you kind of saying you should do this, you should do this, you shouldn't do that. Um, Kind of working on that self-worth and saying you know, saying no doesn't mean that you are not honoring your values of relationships and yeah, working on a lot of things like that. Um, I know for me, I've really learned to do um, like grounding, grounding and protection exercises. Mm -hmm. And um, I know, I mean, I used to work at a hospital and I know, I know even just being in a hospital setting, I felt like it was so energy draining and I had to really kind of check myself at the door, like before I went in and when I would leave and just kind of, um, you know, I guess create these different, um, what's the word like rituals or, or just to kind of what this doesn't belong to me. This doesn't belong to me. All of this. I mean, there's so much heaviness and uh, as I said before, in crowded spaces for me. So learning that and what it is and saying, you know, I'm feeling really sad. Um, I'm feeling really grumpy and knowing, well, I'm like absorbing all of these people, all of their energy and it doesn't belong to me and kind of knowing, kind of knowing that and being able to get rid of it and not take it home with me because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't belong to me. So I don't want it. Um, but grounding or earthing, I think, um, I know, I think earthing is, is that the right where you like, I love, you take your shoes off and stuff. And like, I, I love being barefoot and being barefoot on the grass and the sand, whatever. And just really, um, letting all of that. I just pictured like my, um, like a, 
I always picture like scrubbing brushes, like a white light with scrubbing brushes, just kind of scrubbing, taking all of the stale energy, all the heaviness, all the anything that I just doesn't serve me and just, um, you know, visualizing all of that leaving my body while I'm standing barefoot on the on the ground. And that's been super just really, really helpful for me. And I remember the first time I did it, I was like, oh, yeah. What is this? This is so weird. Somebody had suggested to do it. And I'm like, this is so weird. This isn't going to help. And I remember just feeling like, I don't know, like I took a nap or just like refreshed. And I, I never thought that something like that would work so well. And so I tried, I try to do it as much as I can, but you know, I'm human. I, I don't do it as much as I should, but it's good to have those things that we implement and, yeah. um, and earthing. Yeah. That's something that's really something and sage I, I like to use sage and um I don't know visualizations what about you what are some I mean so many twos I I really feel like any practice that really um like any kind of like embodied practice has been like hugely helpful for me because it's even like that um ability to differentiate myself because I feel like um so much of what it means to be a highly sensitive person is to sort of be this almost like in some forms it feels like I have this perpetually like open stance right where it's like taking in and take versus having more of like a closed stance mm -hmm. um but so that being said sometimes it's just like even like um you know like having like this arm here and then this one and just like kind of like feeling like the container that is my body and realizing that it it is containing whatever it is that's going on inside of me and that this is where I end and begin and uh, kind of even just in the moment and I like doing this with with clients as well because this is one that's pretty um discreet so even it's something that you can do when you're maybe in the middle of like a heated argument or um just in a stressful situation mm -hmm. um to kind of I mean and not just that but that it's also sort of self-soothing as well to sort of keep you in potentially a more regulated um state physiologically at least yeah well it also like represents as boundaries like you know that we have these boundaries that yeah. we're kind of protecting our own protecting our own energy and understanding where we end and you know absolutely, not, absolutely. Yeah. like even just like that reminder of oh I do have boundaries right because like that's the body is, is the container of all of that. Um, yeah. And then I think that's even like what brings me back to even, I love that you like brought that up earlier around like, um, like sort of like the self-worth and um, because in so many ways um, it's, it's kind of like that reminder of like your own, like I need my self-worth, like needs to be protected. I need to honor that. I need to, um, work with that but then even like I think when it comes to um interpersonally when I'm working with people around like really trying to be mindful about like how to protect themselves or how to sort of navigate being a highly sensitive person and maybe like engaging with a unhighly sensitive world <laughs> like an yeah. empathic world right um, even just like the use of um, things like I statements and, and um, kind of staying in that place um, mm -hmm. to again, like just have that distinction of, of I am separate than you. Um, yeah, I think I statements are really important too. That's something I like to work on um, with my clients because I feel like when you are sensitive if you're in a relationship with somebody else and you feel like you intuitively, you just send some things off, unfortunately being an empath and being, um, uh, you know, highly sensitive person, we tend to feel first and then our thoughts come. So I feel like when we feel like something's off, we, we can take, we can let that take over. And then we start to, well, something must be wrong. They must be mad at me. They must be this. And, and using I statements is a really good way to kind of contain that and say, um, you know, I, I, I feel really, I'm feeling really insecure right now um, and being able to communicate that with whoever, you know, the other person is instead of like, um, you're making me feel really uncomfortable. You, you're mad at me or I feel this way. And 
So using those I statements, I think it's a really good way to um, contain those emotions and not, you know, we tend to get get a little carried away with when our emotions get a little too too much. So kind of bringing it in and use the I statements are a good way to open up that conversation. And so, yeah, I like, I like using I statements. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and even just cause so much of it too, is even around like the, the gift of empathy and like being, um, empathic and sensitive is in a lot of ways too, like your sense of intuition is, is usually there. Sometimes it's something that has gone uh, not dormant, but it's sort of like the world around you has maybe like invalidated your sensitivity. So maybe you've started to question your intuition. Yeah. So even just like doing work around that, like reattuning to your intuition and then honoring it, right? Like, like actually good. acting on it, which I recognize is, is in, <laughs> In theory, it sounds a lot easier than it is in practice. Right, which is a, re- is a really good skill to work on in therapy. Yes, yeah, it is. Yeah, something that takes practice. I know that's something with, for me, I've really had to learn how to listen to my intuition because, um, you know, the ego gets in the way and we have to kind of put the ego aside and, and realize that, no, I'm, I'm, I'm listening to me. I trust myself and I, um, I, just kind of shutting, shutting the other noise, shutting the noise off from the outside, from the world and just trusting your own intuition. And, um, but that's, yeah, something, um, I know I do with my clients. It's a good place to work on that in therapy in a safe place, learning to trust yourself. That's a very vulnerable place, especially when you're, you're such a people being a people pleaser and, and, um, you know, coming back to that and just working on trusting yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I know uh, just kind of a couple other things that come up for me just about kind of ma- managing or maintaining these. Um, luckily, we have a really good, uh, we have a really good team at Sage and I know like yeah. diet, yeah, we have Crystal, she's amazing. And diet is something that comes to mind too. Um, I know I've, um, I've used her to help me learn how to kind of connect in that way with my gut, that mind gut or brain gut connection. And she's really good at that. And I, I, how I did really feel a difference when I was eating, eating better and realizing that when I was putting food in my body, that was not serving me. Um, it made me feel more, I think, anxious and more like way down. And I think you kind of get these mixed messages. You're not, you're not, you're not in tune to the environment or into yourself as well as you would be if you were just eating a lot better. And I know drinking water is really important too. Yeah. But yeah, it's there's a lot, there's a lot more into uh, that goes into being an empath and a highly sensitive person, I'm sure, than most most people realize, unless you are one. And yeah. And I like what you're talking about, like even in terms of that, like addressing the um again, like the body, the physical body, because in so many ways, it's, I feel like a a lot of like what it means to sort of re-navigate empathy as a superpower rather than a curse, sort of, it starts with making the body a safe place to be again, Mm -hmm. um, rather than like one that you're, you're seeking to like dissociate out of because the depth of it sometimes you know, you have to learn to swim to navigate the deep waters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's so true. Do you, some of that begins with you know just like w- being mindful of like what's 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 coming in. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I think we've probably. Uh, I was we were talking earlier about how we both kind of use this the impasse survival guide um by judith orloff and i think she's based in la if i'm not she's like the godmother of yeah (laughs) and yes basically yeah and in the um so it's life strategies for sensitive people and what i like is when i have a client who are kind of i'm picking up on some of these patterns and these things that we talked about today and um, i might have them look at that list and i've had clients just 
oh my gosh, like you just really um, kind of opened my eyes up to, I thought I was weird. I thought it was just different. And, and just, I think it's so validating to see it in black and white that it is normal and it's okay and it's beautiful. And so I really like using this book for myself to kind of just, I don't know, check myself. And, um, and, and it, I think it's helpful for, for clients to, to be able to kind of like it like I said, put on, re read it in black and white that this is, it's okay. It's not, it's more than okay. You're not weird. You're not anything else that the, you know, world around you has, there, there's a, you know, a name for it and a reason that you're feeling these and it's, you know, to be okay with it. So I feel like knowledge is always power being, just being aware, like you were saying, being aware of your body or putting a name to it, whatever, but just always, I think just or always learning and um, getting to know yourself and being okay with it so yeah, yeah. for me I think it's kind of all started with this book so um, if those of you who are watching if you feel like you might be an empath this is a good book good book to start off with but Excellent resource yeah so well I think we're probably wrapping we've, we've been talking long enough so maybe we should start wrapping it up and letting everybody get back to their Sunday Yes. Yeah. So any final thoughts or words from you, um, Reagan? I think really just like really wanting to like invite people to um, um, begin like exploring what they might have otherwise felt. Maybe those pieces and parts of themselves that um, felt really like deep and, and to know that you don't necessarily have to start navigating that uh, terrain alone. And it, that's what, um, Renee and I really <laughs> love working with people on is sort yeah. of like figuring out how how to navigate that, especially given holidays are coming up and just this year has been very heavy. Bizarre. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Energy. Yes. Talk about energy. This is the year of feeling energy. And yeah. yeah. Um, and so just knowing that there are safe spaces. Um, that and 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 not just that but like even therapy offers this very like unique sort of opportunity for um non-judgment and, and and as therapists really like our role in in many ways is to help hold space for mm -hmm. what feels like might be too overwhelming to delve into just on your own um so i think yeah that's the biggest thing that i'm really wanting to like communicate to people you don't you don't have to do this alone. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Yep. We have a really, yeah, really great team at Sage too. We're all, I think we're all, we're all very sensitive to um, our clients. And um, but I know this is, this is a topic that Reagan and I just felt like, you know what? We need to talk more about it. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah, I can talk. Yes, I know. Yes. Well, so I guess we'll just, um, you know, we'll leave you all to your, the rest of your day. Reagan, it was so good chatting and getting to see oh, you. Chatting with you. Yeah. So, well, have a good rest of the week and happy November. Thank you for spending some of your time today with us at Sage Holistic Health and Wellness Center. If you like what we're all about, please consider supporting our nonprofit organization by making a tax-deductible donation. To do this, you can go to our website at www.sagewellnessctr.org and click on Donate in the upper right-hand corner. We look forward to spending some time again with you real soon. Take good care.